And tonight's um, talk is going to be given by Dr. Linda Ross um, in, in connection um, with the Dune Ray uh, in Caithness. Um, Linda is an early career research researcher specializing in post-war rural development and her PhD was undertaken um, collaboratively with UHI and Historic Environment Scotland. And she was concerned with looking at the impact of Dune Ray's uh, nuclear fission and social fusion uh, on Caithness. Now, this is a very particularly interesting topic. Um, I personally feel so, and I'm sure Linda does too. And we hope that, uh, that you all will, will take something from um, what she has to say this evening. Um, Linda was uh, formerly a senior curator at the Scottish Maritime Museum, and she maintains a, um, a close interest um, in industrial heritage. Um, but to, tonight she's going to particularly talk about um, Dune Ray and in the abstract that was provided that you will have all read, I'm sure, um, she points out that in 1954, um, Caithness was the chosen location, was, was announced as the chosen location um, for the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, and it's not easy to say that, is it? Um, new fast breeder reactor, um, which was established in this, in this northern region. Um, scientific development um, was to have a huge impact um, on the region, the immediate region, and particularly on the population in, in Thurso, which changed in character um, and expanded. Um, there's obviously um, a, a whole range of different issues um, which were uh, introduced to the region, which we'll hear something of, um, but uh, it's it's the uh, closure of Dune Ray subsequently and the, uh, the um, decommissioning of it, uh, which has also um, had quite an, an impact on the region and continues to this day. Mm -hmm. But so um, I'm very, very uh, delighted really to, to welcome Linda to give us a presentation tonight because um, it's a, a topic which it, to my mind is, is uh, very, very pertinent to um, our contemporary um, lives. So she's going to talk uh, today on Dune Ray, new perceptions of the nuclear north, nuclear north, if I can say it. Um, and I wish you luck with pronouncing all the words you have, <laughs> Linda. <laughs> you're, you're bound to do it better than I do. So thank you very much and, and welcome to our seminar series. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colleen. Uh, thanks for that introduction and for um inviting me to, to speak um, this evening. Uh, now I will just share my screen. Just bear with me while I get that organised. I have a there's a little bit of a lag on my um, computer with this, so please just uh, yeah, bear with me while I get back to the start. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, we'll begin. Um, writing in 1960, a Keith Nice commentator considered the Dunray uh, research, Dunray Experimental Research Establishment a prize which any tourist-minded county would jump at. Capitalising on this enthusiasm, the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, the UK AEA, opened the site's airfield control tower as a viewing platform and visitor centre in June of that year, uh, taking a different view from those who believed that development in the Highlands would deter visitors. The Scottish Tourist Board reported on bright prospects for Scotland's tourist season and congratulated the UK AEA for being so quick to realise the tourist possibilities of nuclear power. So in this, they recognised the attraction not only of the county's um, scenery and beaches, but, quote, the spectacular spheroid uh, construction at Dunray. Such a positive response was justified 8,000 visitors to the control tower over the three-month um, tourist season in 1960 had risen to 20,000 by 1966. Recognising the significance of this unexpected byproduct of the nuclear industry, Goodness County Council selected the Dunray facility as the location for its tourist information service, 
notably uh, the Dunai site was selected over the established tourist draw of the famous John O'Groats, evidence of um, changing patterns within a transformed county. In the six years between the Dunray project's announcement in 1954 and the decision to present the site and its history as a visitor attraction in 1960, Caithness had changed from a region whose economy was dominated by agriculture and fishing to one which, because of technological innovation, was, quote, beginning to talk the jargon of the Black Belt. As the British mainland's most um, northernly county, the UK AEA's arrival brought nuclear science to a rural landscape distant from major population centres in what it stated was an unconventional location. The chosen site was close to Thurso, um, the population of which grew by 147% as a result of the UK AEA, as they put it, importing scientists and engineers from the south. This necessitated the planning and construction of a new architecture for a new community of circumstances, which is unique in terms of patterns of inward migration to the highlands and islands, making Caithness a standout example of technologically induced social development within a rural area. This change um, between 1954 and 1966 will be the focus of my presentation um, tonight. Dunray was not a conventional nuclear power station. It was the site of Britain's first, um, first full-scale fast breeder reactor designed to breed large quantities of fissionable man-made plutonium from natural uranium um, created more plutonium than is used and generating power. This plutonium could be reprocessed and used as reactor fuel in place of uranium. As an experimental system, it was part of the process of establishing the data on which future uh, power generating reactors would be based. The Dunray site grew to include five reactors and the late 20th century saw the rundown of the site's civil reactors as nuclear technology developed. The final one to be taken um, offline was the PFR in 1994 with the commercial reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel and waste ceasing in 1998. The site's currently undergoing decommissioning um, a highly technical process with, importantly, heritage at its centre, something which I'll touch on um, at the end of this paper. Keithness was undeniably distant from the hub of power in the mid-20th century. Now, arguably because of this, it became the focus of experimentation with nuclear power with its location and, and geography itself to the construction of the government's new reactor establishment. Sites all over the UK had been considered, plus others in Caithness and Sutherland, including three in the Sinclair, uh, Sinclair Bay area near Wick, the site north of Brora and Little Ferry near Galsby, but it was Dunray which best met requirements. Its former Admiralty airfield um, provided the UK AEA with an expanse of flat land close to sources of fresh water, nine miles to the west of Thurso, making it close to a ready-made um, community, yet far enough from the population for safety purposes. A UK AEA representative considered Caithness the most remote locality in the UK, reflecting the thinking within the authority at the time. Unaware of the tolerances of its new technology, it couldn't predict the consequences of an accident, nor how remote a remote site should be. The relatively small population in the surrounding area was desirable, a clear indication of the risks involved. And despite this, local reaction was overwhelmingly positive. Although uh, religious leaders voiced concern at the perils of Sunday working, and local employers spoke out against the high wages with which they couldn't compete. Um, 
January was and this is a big however um, cited without consultation meaning that there was no official uh, channel for voice and dissent which itself impacts on the historic record. In his um, statement announcing the choice of site, the Minister of Works, David Eccles, noted that a further advantage of the location was the expected very big contrib contribution to the revival of the Highlands, <clears throat> a benefit which, although subsidiary to geological and geographical requirements, was in the minds of government ministers from the project's outset. This was echoed by MP for Caithness and Sutherland, Sir David Robertson, who used the economic benefit to his constituency as a battle cry. He said, the people in the north of Scotland will realise that perhaps a new era is beginning and that the old one, which depopulated the Highlands, is ending. I believe it heralds the second industrial revolution. The first one passed us by because of our lack of coal. Robertson was instrumental in bringing the research establishment to Cape Ness, and this statement is indicative of the enthusiasm and emotion the project stirred in many. In aligning the Dunray project with an economic shift as significant as the uh, Industrial Revolution, Robertson reveals the extent of his expectations for the development of the far north, which, although over optimistic, were no less ambitious. Writing in the John O'Rourke Journal in February 1955, commentator Thor observed that nowadays one can spot people and a certain number of vehicles too, which somehow have a Dunray look about them. The following September, he noted, citizens have occasionally remarked that it's becoming extremely difficult in Thurzo streets to distinguish between visitors and Dunray people. Dunray people who were somehow different, standing out in a community of 3,000 Thurzonians who were to see their town almost tre uh, treble in size because of one single factor. From the outset of the project, it was certain that the UK AEA would have to import staff into the area and provide them with accommodation. This process, which was a uh, first for Caithness, leads to questions of integration. Uh, similarities, differences, and concepts of them and us. Tonight I'll explore some perceptions of these um, drawing on sources, including official UK AEA correspondents, national and local newspapers, and oral history testimonies to build up an overview. I'll outline how Caithness was represented and establish some of the indicators of difference before touching on what the UK AEA did to facilitate the transition of its imported staff into the area via housing. In um, 1961, Dunray's General Secretary, Donald Carmichael, discussed the, quote, nuclear fission and social fusion, which resulted from the government's decision to cite its new establishment in Caithness. A Caithness man born and bred, Carmichael was the UK AEA's first permanent employee at Junry, having been seconded from the Ministry of Works. Carm <coughs> Excuse me. Carmichael was raised in the manse at Ray, only two miles to the west of the new site, making him a natural source of the local knowledge which was vital for a project which was to affect so much change in the area. His civil service experience of management and administration uh, sat well with his status as a local, making him invaluable to the AEA. This status of being local or otherwise comes up time and time again in my study. Um, in using the term local, I'm referring to people resident within a 20 mile radius of Thurzo before the start of the project. Um, likewise, the terms incomers, newcomers and atomics all refer to those who came into the county from the south to work. These terms are used interchangeably in uh, throughout the, the primary source material and it's how I use them here. 
Um, Carmichael was well aware of the significance of the UK AEA's actions in establishing a nuclear site which was to be largely populated by staff from out with the area um, during its early period. This group of key workers came to be known as the Atomics. During the period of my study, this term refers to those who worked at Doonray and lived there um, and lived in the UK AEA housing estates rather than local people who worked there. The name Atomics is reported to have, quote, rose from the milk records and the toll office where they kept the books. One book was marked Atomics, another book was marked Locals. The Atomics required accommodation and by the completion of the housing programme in 1963, 1,007 houses had been built and six purchased, making a total of 1,013 atomic properties in the area. These houses accommodated the influx of workers from all over the UK and with their influence, the town developed. The process of citing the reactor establishment in Caithness presented a specific set of problems. The population of Caithness in 1954 was approximately 25,000, of whom 40% were in Wick and Thurzel. Agriculture and fishing were the staple industries of the county, but new methods of production were leading to decreases in labour. This is something which the once thriving Caithness flagstone industry had previously undergone, with diminishing employment in industry and trade in the county. There was no manufacturing economy and little focus on scientific and technical subjects in the curriculum due to the primary nature of work in the area. This lack of widespread um, scientific knowledge meant that the UK AEA knew from the outset that skilled scientific and engineering staff would have to be brought in or, as is um, commonly put in their correspondence, imported to Caithness. This was later addressed by an increased focus on scientific and technical subjects in Thurzel High School the development of the Dunray Apprentice Programme um, and the building of the Thursday Technical College to train staff. All this increased the viability of the reactor establishment succeeding within its Caithness setting. The success of this um, was two-way. Newcomers to the area had to adapt to their situation and the Caithness public had to engage with what Prime Minister Sir Anthony Eden referred to as a new age, a scientific revolution as decisive as the industrial revolution many years ago. New techniques, new skills, new trades are being uh, built into our industrial life. In order to embrace this change, the local population was required to deal with the quote, social problem and at the same time opportunity posed by the influx of newcomers to the area. One UK AEA report refers to these newcomers as relatively sophisticated. This is reiterated in the Scotsman, which presents the educated incoming population as possessing fairly sophisticated ways of life. Similarly, the newcomers had to navigate the intricacies of the, uh, the incumbent population with the viability of Dunray uh, report describing the situation in unequivocal terms. It said, the authority influx is as different in quality um, as in quantity in that being made up of scientists, engineers and administrators, it does not graft naturally onto the sociological formation of Caithness at any point. It is non-Scottish and instinctively urban in its outlook. Sociological difference is also highlighted by Robin Sinclair of Thurzel Borough Council, son of the Viscount, Viscount Thurzel, a local but one bound up in the trappings of peerage and therefore unrepresentative of the Caithness population. His lecture given to Dunray employees as a training course in Aberdeen presents the people of the county as insular in outlook. Furthering this, he says that Caithness is, in its history, in its geography, and in its people and outlook, different from any other rural district in Britain, 
and different even from other rural parts of Scotland. This he attributes to the county's unique geography, with it bounded on two sides by the sea and on the third by hills and um, inhospitable peat moorland. This historically um, resulted in a certain isolation from the rest of the mainland and contributed to a past influence by Norse rule, which, quote, accounts for much of the difference in tongue and outlook between uh, the people living in Caithness and their neighbours in Sutherland. Three years later, um, Donald Carmichael repeats the same claim, neatly summarising Caithness as being a product of its geographical position, its inaccessibility except by sea, its history and its limited natural resources, which combined over the centuries to produce a robust, closely knit, self-reliant community, independent to the point of being insular in its outlook, but shrewd, hardworking and hospitable. He continues on the isolationist theme, stating that to travel overland via one of the two roads out of the county takes 10 hours to Edinburgh and 20 to London. In this, he recognises that Caithness, quote, still retains much of its remoteness and its people many of the qualities which that remoteness has engendered. This notion, however, has to be treated with caution. Caithness was by no means a backwater um, with a history of welcoming um, transient populations. The area, particularly Wick, was subject to the seasonal influx of herring workers during the 19th century. Caithness's aerodromes and army camps were home to thousands of service personnel and latterly prisoners of war um, during World War II, and thousands more passed through the county during both World Wars to the naval base at Scapa Flow. Dunray was different, however, in that it brought um, migration on a permanent basis. So it was into this, by all accounts, unique situation that the Dunray employees were entering resulting in the bringing together of what was at the time considered two disparate groups of people. Anthropologist Kimberly Masson states that this sense of difference is still felt today as a quote, atomic confined that 50 years after arrival, 50 years of living Caithness life, they remain excluded and visible as the other of Caithness life. Former Junray, uh, Junray employee Dawn reinforces this says, I don't think I'll ever be local even after 50 years, but I still consider myself almost local. This distinction is significant and is one which is mentioned in the third statistical account of Scotland. Writing in 1983, Mrs. Betty Bradstreet confirms that the term incomers refers to residents of fewer than 50 years, um, a statistic which shows how difficult it was for an atomic to make the transition to local. The first of the atomics began to arrive in early 1955, and Thurzo architect Hugh Sinclair MacDonald addressed the Edinburgh Caithness Association at this key time. MacDonald, another local, had a clear understanding of the situation, having been appointed architect for the UK AEA housing development and honed in on a familiar theme. He said, Thurzo will be faced with many other problems, and one of the greatest will be the impact of many new families, a large percentage being from south of the border. Sir Christopher Hinton referred to the difficulty he had experienced in persuading the personnel at Risley that Caithness wasn't such a, a bad place after all, that we didn't live in igloos, that educational facilities were available and that social amenities would be no less attractive than they are further south. The idea of the frozen north is further evidenced by the experiences of employees. Ethnesian David started work at Dunray in 1957 and discusses misconceptions which existed. He said, you know people from the south phone and say, oh, it must be dreadful up there. You say, no, we haven't got any snow, we've had sunshine and all the rest of it. They've got a perception that this is sort of just south of, nor of the North Pole. And, you know, one of the stories used to be that they issued the seawater pump house workers with rifles to 
shoot the polar bears as they went past on the ice floes. So it's clear that skewed perce perceptions of the area existed. These were often fixed in the minds of staff before they made the journey. Leslie's first thought about the prospect was that he was moving from the UK AEA site at Wimfrith, Dorset to a different world entirely. Taking this into account makes the Thurzo of the mid-1950s a sociological cauldron of us and them. There was no direct precedent for this, with Norseman writing in the Johnny Goat Journal in August 1956 that in this social revolution, Thurzo gets in on the ground floor and its ultimate destiny is unpredictable. Several years later, uh, the UK AEA's Reactor magazine refers to the social experiment of a society which has to, quote, create its own life without many of the so-called advantages of urban civilization. This social experiment reiterates uh, Donald Carmichael's nuclear fission and social fusion address. Dunray's employee number one was aware of the forthcoming unavoidable social change. As a UK AEA employee, Carmichael's reading of the circumstances shows authority awareness of potential difficulties caused solely by its project. In raising these problems, um, Carmichael had one aim to reinforce that the UK AEA had tackled these to ensure a rapid and smooth expansion of the Caithness community. How they did this was held up by some as a progressive example of planning, which enabled Thurzo's expansion not only in size, but in, quote, maturity and social urbanity. Staffing the establishment was naturally one of the first considerations in an area with a small decreasing population, now primarily agricultural um, skills base. UK AEA therefore envisaged, quote, difficulties in attracting suitable staff as far north as Thurzo, as they wished to be near shops, schools and amenities. Thurzo, of course, did have shops, schools and amenities and was in fact punching above its weight in terms of um, shops per population. Its existing amenities were the reason it was chosen um, for the, as the the site for the construction of UK AEA housing. Negative perceptions of Caithness have thus far um, dominated drawing on speeches given by Donald Carmichael, Hugh Sinclair MacDonald and Robin Sinclair. Each, however, um, makes sure to counteract the negative of glowing accounts of the area. As Hugh Sinclair MacDonald says, we have our clubs, badminton, bowling, bridge, cycling, football, golf, shooting, tennis, Toastmasters, pigeon fanciers, and for garden lovers, a rock garden club. In the, in the arts, we have a strong dramatic club and a society of artists. Music has a very strong hold, and there are choirs, just space societies, a thriving annual festival, and bands both pipes and brass. We can also offer a uh, loch, river, and sea fishing bathing from magnificent beaches. The water is so warm that some ladies bathe all year round. Country dancing and, and, and an unending round of dinners, dances and fist drives. So MacDonald in this impassioned statement presents a series of facts suggestive of an existing community with all the trappings of civilized uh, society rather than one which, as the Scotsman later put it, was about to, quote, leave the dark ages behind. Several primary sources address this idea of Caithness as a rural backwater head on, questioning the nature of the remote. Following the official announcement that Caithness was to host the reactor, Sir David Robertson MP thanked the government for quote, its courage and vision in choosing a site in what is called a remote area. Vision and to some extent courage were undeniable, but Robertson proceeded to dispute the claim of the remote, declaring nothing is remote in the British Isles. You could put the whole of the British Isles six times into Texas and it would still be inside Texas, which is only one of the 49 states of the US. An area is not remote to someone who's living there, as Thor testifies. He says, 
this word remote has been applied to the county very frequently lately. It was used by more than one speaker at the atomic meeting. It has also been heard from BBC announcers on a number of occasions, and it has figured too in the news columns of daily newspapers. In these days of air travel, most people in the north do not regard the county as being at all remote and consider a trip of a few hundred miles as a commonplace matter. Perhaps it is time that a little less was heard about the alleged remoteness of Cape Ness. Kidness's mid 20th century evolution continued to be influenced by national development in the same way as economic and industrial revolutions had made their mark in the preceding uh, centuries. With the latter, Kidness was far removed in distance from the epicenter of these developments in the industrial um, heartlands of Scotland and England. Kidness of the mid 1950s, however, was at the centre of nuclear development. In this regard, other places were remote from the county rather than the county being remote from other places. And I'm sure as we all know, this is a debate which continues today, um, showing that little has changed despite continued effort through the decades to launch the concept of remoteness. Perceptions are one thing, and um, how the situation played out in reality is another. The discussion so far has centred on concept rather than physical change. Um, it was the latter which enabled the newcomers to settle in Thurso, and its chief manifestation was in the development of two large areas of housing at Pennyland and Mount Vernon. To provide for its staff, the UK AEA quickly identified that the lack of surplus accommodation in the area made it necessary to provide houses for the newcomers. Given the limited resources of the local authority, the UK AEA had no option but to provide the houses themselves and very much considered themselves to be reluctant landlords. <clears throat> In March 1957, the Glasgow Herald reported that Junray was one of the showpieces of the world. <clears throat> Not only did it laud the plant itself, but declared that the UK AEA was, quote, devising a style of town planning and domestic architecture to match, except for roofs of local slate and some eccentricities of line. They might be imported direct from East Kilbride, Bracknell, or any of the more elegant new towns. This alignment of Thurso with the new towns places the expansion of the borough within its context of mid 20th century uh, planning and development. The borough had to meet housing needs for a rapid population increase, much as new towns were built to accommodate overspill populations from cities. Although on a smaller scale, architecture and planning were as much a concern for Thurso in the far north as they were for any of the new town developments in the central belt and beyond. All the properties except eight in Scrabster and six in Castletown were built in Thurzel with timber non-traditional houses, traditional and semi-traditional brick houses, all electric A-type houses, flats and maisonettes constructed. Uh, single people and apprentices were accommodated in one of the hostels that Ormley Lodge or neighbour house. The size of house allocated depended on grade, um, a polarisation summarised neatly by the UK EA's DA Sherlock as being of a better class type for higher managerial staff and being of normal council type for the remaining eligible staff. With the reactor site expected to be cleared of its infrastructure within the next 20, 30 years, the physical remains of the fast breeder program will not be scientific. Um, what will endure are these physical markers of community. Housing was not just essential for accommodating workers, it was also a necessary tool for the UK AEA in attracting employees to the far north. Its recruitment policy for January had two main objectives. Um, quote, to find locally all the unskilled workers who would be required and to entice from the South professional and skilled people. 
housing was provided for those coming into the area rather than those based locally. A UK AEA report explained that, quote, inducements were necessary to attract the large numbers required to an area which was remote from urban civilization. In 1954, the Industrial Group's Director of Administration confirmed the bait, stating, that is one of the carrots we are holding out to those we wish to attract to Caithness. Nice, well laid out houses. The incentive of housing worked. Don, who started work at Dunray in 1961, was clear about his reasoning for accepting a post at Dunray. He says, London was large and not very user friendly to a fellow from Ireland. Dunray was offering housing and all sorts of benefits. It was housing. It was the attraction of a certain freedom out of the city. It was the attraction of apparently new frontier science and new, front, uh, new frontier support, which uh, I think is a, just, just a great quote. Such accounts link the lure of participating in cutting edge scientific work with the opportunity to live in brand new housing, a heady mix of new science, modern housing and new arrivals into one area. The original UK AEA brief was that the housing should be integrated into the town of Thurzle rather than forming a standalone district. As architect, uh, architect Hugh Sinclair MacDonald stated, it was stressed that it was the earnest wish of the authority that its officers should become an integral part of the community. Any idea of having an atom suburb was to be deprecated. Alongside this, local construction materials were to be used as far as possible. These plans were intended to have two effects, um, to ensure that the atomics were not segregated, aiding integration uh, with the existing population, and using local materials to blend the new architecture with the old. Um, as it turned out, however, cost meant that segregation and modern cheap materials couldn't be avoided. So the atomic housing was physically set apart from the town with its modern non-traditional structures standing out as markedly different from the stone buildings which previously identified um, Thurzo's urban character. Um, and you can see from the, the map on, on, on the screen um, the areas of atomic housing marked in red. Um, its residents were immediately defined as atomics, their place of residence as well as their place of work, identifying them as newcomers to the area. This dichotomy between locals and incomers runs through the literature of migration studies in the Highlands and Islands. Atomic was synonymous with, yet removed from, other terms which appear repeatedly in source material including incomers, newcomers, and their opposites of local, native, and indigenous. Significantly during this period, some of the terms later used for migrants from other parts of Britain, and particularly England, did not apply. The term white settlers, for example, was developed in the 1960s as an unreconstructed colonial metaphor, embodying all the negative implications of imperial conquest. Like atomics, that immediately signified difference. Unlike atomic, it was a, ne a negative term. Much is also written about the adverse connotation of the use of incomers as a label. Placing it in its sociological context, Catherine Burnett states that, to put simply, the incomer is overwhelmingly constructed as a negative influence or threat to the local way of life. Well, Kathleen Banks, owner of Thurzo's General Store, the quote, strange people put an end to the quiet mornings when I could enjoy a gossip, and at first I didn't like it. This anticipation of a conflict or a clash of cultures is dramatically described in the Scotsman in December 1957. It reported, if I were what the Americans call a human engineer, I would regard the incomers on the one hand and the natives on the other as socially two critical masses, which when brought together could either explode or be controlled in such a way as to produce something entirely new and encouraging uh, in the way of social life. 
working in cooperation with the local authorities, the UK AEA's social fusion was carefully controlled. An analysis of contemporary articles and reports shows that there was no explosion. Even Kathleen Banks came round, enjoying seeing the quote, fresh faces, which increased her trade. This is not to say that negative feelings didn't emerge on both sides. One man from Wick avowed this in the 1950s, the incomers were, quote, considered a sort of subspecies. We didn't make it easy for them. We shut them out. They didn't get a chance. The prevailing dialogue, however, is one of positivity. A 1961 article in Dunray's unofficial works magazine, Haggis, details the peaceful and happy integration of at least two cultures, two different ways of life. UK AEA correspondence records that, quote, it is a truism to say that by and large, the incoming folk are mixing well with everyone and playing a valuable part in forging a new and beloved community. So David Robertson took a similar positive view in 1959, stating, newcomers brought to the area by this plant were settling down in magnificently most welcome. In a feature in the Scotsman in 1962 entitled The Nuclear Age Has Been Absorbed, Magnus Magnuson wrote, What holds Thurzo together is nothing less than the most lively sense of community I have come across in my travels throughout Scotland. The near perfect marriage between locals and incomers, between the townspeople and what they affectionately call, affectionately call the atomics. It is this conscious act of integration that is at the heart of the centrifugal energy of Thurzo. There is, of course, diversity in any lived experience, but comments like Magnuson's serve to reflect the Dunway Zeitgeist, a project undertaken in a period of rapid post-war growth, replete with economic and technological expansion and all that it promised. Personal testimony shed some light on how this was experienced at the time. Atomic Sydney remarked that there was no hostility, but there was definitely an us and them kind of, kind of, kind of attitude. Thurzo and thereabouts have really been in a world of its own, quite different from what people in the South might think. Alistair, who was born just across the site fence at Dunray, reflects, them and us, not as much as there might have been when the initial movement of this mass of people came in. John was emphatic in his belief that there was never a them and us attitude, they were welcome. Wickborn Donnie explains, yes, they were in, in, incomers initially, but eventually they were most welcome, you know, really. So that word, word atomic lost its convolution, really. This reflects a process of osmosis with um, commentator James Reevy revealing his two way, he says, uh, there is now a chain store in the main street of Old Thurzo, and former fishermen and shepherds are working with and can discuss such things as gamma radiation and biological shields. On the other hand, one-time hustling city dwellers find that, as rhetorically desired by the poet, they have no time to stop and stare. This is an insightful indication of how life in the far north was changing and is indicative of the cooperation between the disparate organisations of UK AEA and the local authorities, and between groups considered, um, quote, widely different in their, in their antecedents and outlook. This uh, cooperation is at the centre of Dunray's social success during the first 10 years of its operation a period which serves as evidence of a counter-narrative to the prevailing discourse of Highland depopulation in the mid-20th century. Dunray brought migrants and it brought jobs, revitalising the area. Industry was now being promoted as second nature to a crofting class, which, as with the majority of the population of the UK, had no previous working knowledge of the nuclear industry. Rather than being used in reference to agriculture and tradition, within 10 years of Dunray's announcement, the crofter virtue of loyalty was being used to promote the efficacy of Caithnesians as industrial workers. Caithness's people had become nuclear citizens. The county itself was at the centre of nuclear development. 
and quickly became synonymous with a technology which prior to March 1954 had been uh, alien. As a postscript, I'd like to reiterate that tonight um, I've concentrated on the initial phase of Junior's development when nuclear became an indelible part of um, the far north of Scotland. Um, bringing things up to date, a change equally as significant as its sort of arrival is underway. Junior's being decommissioned, a process which will see the reactor site reach its interim care and maintenance end state, at which point decommissioning will be considered um, complete and further remediation, such as radioactive decay, will be passive uh, in the 2030s and its final end point whereby the site can be released for all uses by 2,333. The period between the early years of optimism and decommissioning offer an opportunity to consider situations um, which weren't at the forefront of UK AEA thought in the 1950s and highlight the darker um, side of nuclear power. The long-term deep time consequences of waste disposal, for example, were not planned for. The rise of anti-nuclear awareness and environmentalism was not anticipated, and the effects of a series of health safety incidents at the plant could not be predicted. When cleared, the site will contain um, low and intermediate level waste in, I think, near site and near surface storage repositories in accordance with Scottish government policy. All of these aspects um, contribute to the site's complex history. As part of decommissioning, the distinctive fast breeder reactor containment sphere, alongside all other buildings on site, um, are expected to be demolished. An act which garners a mixed response, uh, ranging from those who believe it should stay and become some sort of museum, to those who favour the practicality of just taking it down. Under these circumstances, the need to address heritage while the site is still extant is increasingly time critical. Tackling this in 2010, Junray Site Restoration Limited, with input from the Nuclear Decommission Decommissioning Authority in Historic Scotland, published the Junray Heritage Strategy which sets out the best means of creating a cultural legacy for the site based on evidential, historic, aesthetic and communal values. As much of the UK's nuclear state moves from being home to innovative technology to the preserve of heritage within a generation, it becomes part of a growing body of work addressing nuclear cultural heritage. This crosses professions and disciplines and can be broadly defined as anything that has come into contact with nuclear science and technology, a vast and hybrid field. Although the decommissioning of nuclear sites across countries underway, the Junry Heritage Strategy is the first of its kind in the United Kingdom. And I'd like to mention the excellent work done by Junry's James Gunn on this topic. Um, also, James's guidance has been such a huge help um, to me since I started my research in 2015. And uh, the Heritage Initiative is now being rolled out NDA wide and without exaggeration, it's, um, it's groundbreaking work. So uh, to conclude, as Carly Kehoe and um, Crystal Gleish outline in their work on history, heritage and sustainable development in the Highlands, heritage is both a living process which comes from and draws on the past and an active and dynamic part of the present. So much like decommissioning itself, um, with this in mind, the very fact that Britain's nuclear heritage approach was pioneered at this site stands as testament to its place in shaping present day KS. Thank you. That's me. I will stop uh, screen sharing just now and um, welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Linda. That was fascinating, really fascinating. Um, I've, um, 
just to remind people that they can put questions in the chat um, and um, very happy to relay them uh, to, to Linda and to the uh, wider audience here. But just while we're waiting for, for people to digest several of the things that you've said, um, I, I'm really struck by the, um, the, the, obviously the social impact, the long-term social impact um, of a, a completely new population coming into a, um, an area which many people, as you said, would uh, consider to be remote. I personally don't consider it to re be remote and I never have done, but, but some people do. Um, so one of the things that, um, sorry, there's all sorts of funny things happening here. Ines Miller suddenly appears. Um, but uh, basically um, one of the things that um, I would just like to, to, to ask your opinion on really is um, obviously with the decommissioning um, of, of the facility, um, the population um, who've, who've known Caithness or become Caithnesian, if you like, over you know, 50 or 60 years of, of involvement in the, in the facility, um, they will stay, many of them uh, uh, stay, because this is where this is home for them. Um, and, and obviously this is something which is quantifiable. Uh, the younger generations would move perhaps away, maybe not, um, but um, it has a, a longer lasting impact on uh, the population, the nature of the population of, of Caithness. So is this something that you have been able to see in your research that you know, there is a, a will to stay in Caithness, there's a wish to stay there because it's home? Um, or do you see um, a, um, attempts, a large scale attempts to move south, back south? Um, in, in because my research um, was, was focusing on the, the earlier period of Dunray development, um, I, I, in, when I was looking at things, say for example, oral history, um, it was focused on people who were um, working in the area at that time in the 1950s and 1960s. And also I should say that these um, oral histories uh, were mainly recorded by James Gunn, who I, I mentioned in my presentation, and they're available um, to consult at uh, Nucleus, the Nuclear Archive in WIC. Um, but yes, from those uh, oral histories, for example, um, in, in the, the, the people who were interviewed, um, I think there was a, a strong feeling amongst them that they always wanted to stay as, you know, pretty much as soon as they arrived, they knew that they wanted to um, stay in Caithness uh, quickly, very quickly, it feels like uh, it, it became their home. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that's true of people through throughout the generations. Um, yeah, I mean, there are people on this call um, who perhaps would be able to better answer um, that question than me. Um, so if any of them feel free to um, pipe up or um, write, uh, write answers in the chat. But, uh, Hope oh, that kind of answers your question. <laughs> well, it, it does, yes. I mean, um, and just while we're waiting again for for any any questions to come in, I mean, one of the things that strike that strikes me is, of course, that um, we were talking about much earlier influxes into Caithness, um, um, transient, if you like to think of them, but but actually much more lasting in their impact. With, uh, for example, Second World War. Um, you mentioned the herring fisheries, which is perhaps more transient. Um, the Norse, of course, before that, um, giving a permanent presence mm. there and, and a long lasting one. Um, so I think it's a, um, an area which is very, very vibrant uh, and, and very, very welcoming, even though um, the, the numbers of people involved must seem um, staggering or must have seemed staggering in the 1950s. Yeah, and it's, you mentioned the, the Norse influence there. When we see that continuing um, during Dunray's development with a number of the streets uh, in, an, in the Atomic Housing Estate named after various North, North influences, um, Thorpal Road, St Magnus Road, the, these sorts of, 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 of places. So mm -hmm. there is a, a sense of connecting with that, that North, um, North Pass uh, in this project of extreme modernity. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating topic. Um, I, are there any further 
questions anybody wish to um to chime in to type to type in the chat um, well, one thing I thought... here we are sorry yes go yes what well, we uh, i was just going to say that um i'm currently uh working at the university of glasgow in the department of um in economic and social history and i'm looking at nuclear developments in the 1970s, 1980s, mainly in the south of Scotland, particularly the, the development of Torness um, power station and also the campaign against potential waste disposal in, in the Galloway Hills. And um, it's just very interesting to see the, the flip in opinion in, in what was just a 20 year period between the 1950s when it was all largely positive to the 1970s and 1980s when we see a growing um, number of protest groups and environmental awareness and um, it, it, it's interesting to, to yeah compare both situations yeah. and it's certainly um, doing this current research makes me look back on my Jim Ray research in, in a with a slightly different hat on that time. Yeah, yes, it's fascinating. Um, there, there's, a, there's a couple of comments come in, um, both of which are, are particularly interesting, I think. Um, one is from, from Gillian, who's, who's listened this evening. So welcome, Gillian. Thank you. Hi. Um, she, she said basically that she'd moved to Thurso in 1965, not as an atomic, but as the wife of an Episcopalian minister. She was made very, very welcome. Uh, she left two years later, um, but she still has close friends um, both in the UK AE, 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 uh, um, and in others, um, and that many, uh, in fact, her as she says, her atomic friends all stayed on in the area. So this was home. This was a, a, a new population and of, of people who, who belonged there, let's put it that way. Um, the question that's come in from uh, Frank Stewart says, what employment is available for atomics who stayed on? Those who were still in work, of course, because most of them would be um, retired by now. Um, well, I guess work on site has remained um, at a high level throughout um, decommissioning um, at, at the moment. So I imagine that a lot of people who went to work um, have, yeah, yeah, have, have maintained um, employment on site. Um, and uh, you know, it's still at present the, the, the major employer um, in the area. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of other developments um, underway now with regards to renewable power and um, projects relating to that, certainly in, in the WIC area that will provide um, uh, possible suitable accommodation, uh, suitable employment, perhaps. Um, but again, others will uh, be better placed to answer that than me. So, certainly my, my friends who've worked at, at, at Dune Ray are all involved, remain involved in the decommissioning. Mm. Um, but uh, there's a, a question here from, um, from Chris Coymans saying, uh, could you say anything about social parallels between the development of Thurso and the development of towns in the vicinity of other so-called peripheral nuclear power stations, such as uh, Hunterston and Chapel Cross? Um, yes, yeah, certainly, um, particularly, particularly with regards more to Chapel Cross than Hunterston. Um, there were similar um housing estates built in Annan, for example, not to the same extent as in Thurso in that the, the quantities of housing weren't so um dramatic, but there was certainly a, a lot of um social nuclear related developments in the Annan area which have parallels with what was happening in Thurso. Mm -hmm. um, similarly around I think it's a similar similar story can be told for all of Britain's um, nuclear related sites. Um, there, there are common themes which emerge in terms of people coming into an area, but 
most importantly is the, the local nuances which also come out of that. Um, so while you can you can tell a, um, a coherent story of um, how these places developed, it's the local um, impacts which had their own impact on the development of Britain's um, nuclear power programme. So I think one thing I often say is that this study that I've done with Jun Wei could be repeated at any um, of any of the UK's nuclear sites, any global nuclear site really it is. It is it's a vast subject, which is incredibly interesting, with lots of social stories to tell. Thank you. And um, just one last question here. This is from Peter Morgan, who says, um, what was the reaction in WIC to the fast growth in Thurso, the apparent shift in the local balance? Uh, yes, yeah, that, that's, that's very true. And um, to put it simply, I think there was some jealousy. Um, I've, I've just, just read comments um, by the local council, for example, who themselves wanted to, I guess, get more benefit from this influx of population in Thurso. Um, they did, for example, offer to the UK AEA um, space for housing um, for atomic workers, um, but that was never developed. I mean, WIC did develop its own atomic community and there was a, um, a Jumeirah Social Club based in WIC and people um, bust in to, to do me from that, that side of the county as well. Um, but yeah, WIC didn't see the, the, the same benefits. Um, there was even talk at one point of them changing the county town from WIC to Thurzo. So obviously that didn't go down well in, in the east, east of the county. But yeah, so there was a, an interesting an interesting dialogue going on there, a lot of feelings involved. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I think um, with, with that, I think we, we should try and uh, bring the session to a close. Um, I first of all would like to say thank you so much, uh, Linda, for the presentation. Um, you gave an, an insight into aspects which um, we often don't think about. Um, uh, if, perhaps if we're not living in those communities, we, we're not too aware of the, of the, the balances and checks and balances of, of a completely uh, new population coming in. Very interesting um, issue.